Welcome back to HPC Tech Shorts, the engineering water cooler here in AWS. Today, we're kicking off an extravaganza of Cryo EM with the help of our friends from KEK in Japan. If you've never heard of KEK before, it's Japan's national high energy research facility, um, and it's located in the beautiful city of Tsukuba. Yusuke Yamada is an assistant professor there and an X-ray crystallographer. His colleague, Toshio Moria, is an associate professor and a Cryo EM guy. And thankfully, I have Brian Shervin with me. He's our Cryo EM guru on the HPC specialist team here in AWS, and he acted as my Sherpa through the whole experience. The KK folks have done something we think is unique because they've built a distributed computing framework around their distri already distributed Cryo EM facilities, and they've done so in a way that they didn't lose any of the benefits they used to get from having a centralized compute platform. As you'll have guessed, it involves a big use of cloud. This isn't just a story of the cloud in research though. It's a masterclass in how the cloud can be used to share knowledge, expertise, and experience. Um, and it's a lesson in how to squeeze the most out of every facility, especially when COVID was preventing people traveling to the sites they needed to go to for work or meeting with their colleagues to share insights. Now, along the way, they solved dozens of problems and the results are amazing. There's too much here though for one episode. So we're breaking this discussion up into four shows. The first one will focus on the challenges posed by Cryo EM and the need to keep research going across the nation when COVID happened. The second episode will talk about the solution details of what they built. In the third episode, we'll, talk, we'll discuss the impact all this had on the efficiency and utilization of the facilities across the country and the way it changed the way individual scientists work, which is where the real impact is felt. Um, and in the final episode, that's a deep dive into the arsenal of benchmark data they've amassed, which the CryoEM junkies watching this channel can use to make their own decisions about what's going to be the best CPU and GPU combinations for your workloads at the resolutions you're working at. We pick up the conversation today with Yamada-san explaining why CryoEM is catching the interest of crystallographers like him. Hope you get a lot out of it. Yeah, so, uh, so before the uh, evolution of CryoEM, but uh, so uh, mainly so X-ray X-ray crystallography is a major method to solve the structure of the protein. But the the merit of the X-ray crystallography is that it needs the crystal, hmm. and crystallization of the protein is very hard work. So, so can I, can so, I, so uh, Mori san you you yeah? suddenly you've become the cool guy. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, definitely. People think <laughs> that I'm great because I know the single particle analysis, <laughs> but. You know what? The reality is not that easy. So, for example, if the protein can be crystallized already, right, and many of the important protein for the drug design is actually uh, some of them are easy to crystallize, like enzyme especially, and some of them are not really easy for the cryo EM, especially small protein still. Hmm. So, one of the surprise for me is when I came to KK. I started doing the cryo EM, applying the cryo EM for the enzymes, which is under 100 kilodalton, because our user used to do the crystallization, right, crystallography. So they, of course, have the relatively small protein. And it was not common for me because my interest was the uh, membrane proteins, which is larger than 200 kilodalton usually. Right. So actually, still, it's complemental. Uh, the benefit is that, the, you, you know, if it's crystallized, it, it can be crystallized, the protein can be crystallized, then actually the throughput is much higher with X-ray crystallography. And also that the, the, it's easy relatively with small protein. And also you can reach to much higher resolution very easily after you get crystallization. So there's tons of uh, advantage for the crystallization for me. So. As a cryo EM guy, the one of the benefit for us, and it's popular now, is because of the freezing uh, freezer project, as you know. Have you ever heard of the freezer project? No. No? Well, the crystallographer trying to uh, crystallize many of the large protein, especially member protein, but they are not successful. But they purified really well, right? So, but they couldn't crystallize and do the structure analysis. So they put then these proteins in the freezer. <laughs> okay. After that, yeah, it's very famous for our field. That the, the so after that, the, you know, the resolution revolution of the prior EM, people realize, oh, we might be able to solve our structure with cryo EM. So the many protein came out of the freezers. 
And it's basically, this is one of the reasons why that our field is so booming, because there is a stock of the really highly purified proteins, especially member proteins. Uh, so in the case of the cryo EM, so we usually use the GPU box, but unfortunately the many researcher uh, of structural biology that don't have the enough knowledge, for example, to set up the computers and install the uh, Linux and install the software and so on. It's difficult if you've never done it before, right? It, it's not just a single application, right? I mean, the, the CryoM scientists are, you're using things like RelyOn, CryoSpark, but lots of other tools, right? It's, yep. it's a whole suite of software. Yeah, right. So there's a whole suite of software. It's complicated. The scientist just wants to use it as a tool. They're not, the scientist actually really isn't all that passionate about Slurm or the choice of MPIs or whether EFA is, a, is better than, than gigabit ethernet. <clears throat> they just want a tool, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And on top of it, cost is getting higher too, uh, yeah. because that the, the we are using more data set. Uh, I mean, that the larger data set now to reach mm -hmm. to the higher resolution. And on top of it, the GPU is getting more expensive because of the uh, speed, right? Yep. So the and also this, that the, as Brian said, that the, the setting up the software environment on the computer after this decided best the specification, which they don't know, they have no clue. Right? <laughs> and then they have to set up the software environment. But the problem is CUDA is not easy. I won't tell the people at NVIDIA you said that. Actually, if the people from NVIDIA are listening. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Maybe you get cut. Right? <laughs> no, you're right. It is none of this. Look, none of this is easy. If you're a scientist, you're thinking about the science. You're not thinking about Linux and system administration tools and patching systems, right? So, Just to ask, so you, it, it wasn't like you had a, a dedicated single supercomputing center for KEK for this. It sounds like your your scientists are distributed across the country and it's kind of up to them to potentially even purchase their own computing resources as well as set up and administer. Is is, is that my understanding? You, you didn't have like a single supercomputing center available for this? That uh, computer center is for uh, mainly particular physics. And uh, also, so in the case of the GPU, so, so this is a very new technology and it updates uh quite frequently running. right right so that uh, one of the uh, benefit of the using the cloud is that everybody uses uh, one system right cloud is a virtual one system so that means that they can use the exactly same real uh, the configuration of the software and also hardware setting of course there is variety inside but basically it's, uh, we need setup environment for one system not multiple system and uh, one of my experience that the the you know nightmare was that the installation every time we buy new computer gpu is different the cpu is different number of cpu is different so i have to basically sometimes configure that those uh, the, uh I, I have to basically uh tweak the installation to make the installation of the reliant works for example and also the other component which is that the relay you use, because some of them use a different CUDA version. And wow. that's a really nightmare for me. Wow. So the AWS is great because those are already done. Most of the, most of the necessary component is uh, installed, especially CUDA. So we just run the install installer and that's it. <laughs> right. So it's really great for the developer or the administrator to maintain one system and we know that the, exactly the how hardware works. Well, it's not exactly, but the, almost. <laughs> yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. <clears throat> so the, the one of the major reasons why, in particular, that the Japan needs this kind of the cloud environment is because uh, we have a limited number of the cloud EMs, especially high end, right, with auto order system. So we have uh, about 20. Uh, U.S. and China and Europe has uh, uh, 10 times more. Simply, we have a very few number over the prior year. So we have to utilize this well. Yeah, well, so I, I, I want to ask, so just to kind of frame it, so you, um, I mean, you say you've got only a few, but they're, they're obviously widely distributed. 
and I'm I'm curious sort of what it looked like before your your go to your go to cloud solution. And maybe you're going to get into that and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm curious what it looked like in terms of sample preparation and and data acquisition and and data analysis. Like would would people have to travel around to to visit different microscopes that they had scheduled time on? Um, and and I'm assuming that's that would have been a challenge over the last two years or so, given COVID restrictions. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you, can, if you can talk a little bit about kind of what it looked like before you set up this solution. You know, we've seen this in another couple of other domains where it's, you know, the uh, central facilities trying to provide, you know, computational uh, tools that are on the side of that to be able to interpret the data. Um, the ability to actually, I mean, the... This this stuff maps very well into a cloud scenario because the customers, you know, the users can come along, run their, you know, in your case, they can they can run their experiments on the, you know, on the cryo AM facility off your beam line. Um, mm -hmm. That to them, that's the infrastructure that they're using. They can do the compute using their AWS accounts using your software, um, and then when they're done, they take their own data with them. They take their own workloads with them, and um, all of the results and analysis goes with them in their own AWS account, and it's it's right. separable. Right, uh, it's like they've come to use your supercomputer and then taken a little chunk of the su supercomputer with them when they were finished. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> being able to fork and clone uh, a supercomputer is kind of handy. Yeah, the the one of the main problem for us is many actually university has a big supercomputer, right? Especially major university in Japan. Mm -hmm. But I had many people having the problem using it, and one of them is availability. But the other is also that the many of the supercomputer computer is not general purpose often. It's often dedicated for something, right? There is an original design and specification. And sometimes it doesn't fit for the, our uh, uh, cryo EM uh, application. And then people say, nah, like one of the problem is data set is too big often. Now, just a reminder, this is just one episode in four in our series on cryo EM. Stay tuned for the other shows or check them out. Uh, check out the, the show notes here for links to them. If there's something you want to see us cover in a future episode of Tech Shorts, come and find us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. Thanks.